but this week we have been learning a lot about cherry trees uh, because there are many different kinds and you can watch the other videos they're all on my website and you can look at the the slides with all the pictures that I uh, have been showing to people if you're interested in learning about cherries that we learned about on Monday and Tuesday and today I think we're probably going to spend most of our time uh, focusing on pests and diseases that affect cherries because there are a lot of them and yesterday towards the end of the lesson when I asked if uh, you all were interested in learning about that stuff um, it seemed like you were you were interested so uh, I'm going to start going into that um, honestly as young people if you grow up learning and knowing and looking out for these sorts of pests and diseases if you as young people already know what to look for you're going to be miles ahead of almost everyone uh truly teaching people about pests and diseases you know like pest insects bad insects and uh fungus and bacteria and viruses that affect especially fruit trees is something that most people have no idea what to what to look for um so uh, and they're pretty common so the earlier you can find any of these things on whether they be trees that are in your gardens or trees that are in your yards or trees uh that are growing around your neighborhoods or in the woods when you notice something that seems a little bit off i bet the the more you learn to identify things the more you're going to recognize when things don't seem healthy so uh, I think I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start peppering in, sprinkling in a little bit of these lessons to show you when things aren't so good, uh, what to look for. And we can talk about, um, you know, how to, how to deal with those things too. But primarily, your number one greatest defense in taking care of things that um, are sick is keep giving them healthy ecosystems to grow in which you're learning about uh every day with with me and in you know doing things with your parents um and also catching things early so if you are it, that's why if you know what to look for and you're seeing weird things happening uh the earlier you catch them the better always if they get out of control um a lot of times there's really nothing you can do and i think it's important that we do things organically um and and try to you know not use synthetic fault you know fake chemicals and things that that can hurt us and that can hurt other beneficial creatures around so does that all make sense to you does this sound good cool let's jump in to the presentation that i made for you for today um and feel free like in the last couple of days um, feel free to unmute yourself if I'm not seeing you right away. Uh, and if the, uh, the chat, sometimes I, I'm having a hard trouble, trouble, a hard time, uh, getting to quickly. So just feel free to poke at me if you have questions and I'm not seeing you. So this is our presentation for the day. It's mostly just a bunch of pictures and uh just as usual trying to be the best quality pictures i can find um and um so we're still looking at cherry trees are this in the prunus uh genus so they're prunus they're different species of prunus which is also the plum and apricot uh family and uh, some people, some scientists call them Cerasis. Oh, I wrote this wrong. They're the Cerasis subgenus. So that means that underneath Prunus, before you get to their actual species names, sometimes you'll see them referred to as Cerasis. Um, that's just a, a Latin, your, your Latin lesson for the day. There's a bunch of Latin in here. And uh, basically the reason that I put the Latin in here is because the more you see it, the more it will just kind of stick in your memory, even if you don't 
remember it or understand it, you're going to see these words in the future and you're going to be like, oh, I, um, you know, I recognize that word. And it's, I promise that the more you see these things, the more you're just going to recognize them. Um, and that's going to be pretty cool when you remember things that you didn't even know you knew. Um, happens to me all the time. So this is our first disease. It, has anybody ever seen anything that looks like this? What does it look like to you? Um, I mean, besides what it says over here, what does it look like? Um, I'm going to go to Elijah because you haven't been here the past couple of days. It looks like honey. Looks like honey. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else? Uh, Baron, what's it look like? It looks kind of like sap. Yes. Yeah, does look like sap. So... It's interesting because this, uh, this disease is something that's very, this, this thing called a canker. Um, canker is basically the wound that is opened up in the tree because of, of this particular disease. I believe that this, yeah, so this pseudo, pseudomonas is how you say that, um, is a bacteria that infects the, the tree, especially like an open wound in the tree. Uh, what's up, Elijah? My grandpa tree, um, he has a little tray in the front yard. His tree um, has that Yeah, I, I bet. It's, it's very common, especially in, um, in wet weather, especially when there's a lot of wet weather, which we've been having a lot more of here um, in pa recent years. He, he's just had it. He's had it for a couple of years. Already. Yeah, and the, wor the, longer it, the longer it sits around uh, without being treated or taken care of, uh, the worse it gets. Um, and eventually it, this is a disease that eventually will kill a tree if you don't catch it early. So it's important to see, and, and it's hard for a lot of people to know whether they're dealing with just sap. So for example, if you cut off a branch of a tree or if a branch breaks off of a tree, sap will ooze out. And sap is a natural protection for the tree. When sap comes out, it, it's, it's kind of like a, like a tree's Band-Aid. Uh, it would be like what happens to us when we form a scab uh, over a wound. But when this particular bacteria is present uh, in the air and, or on the bark, um, or it's like sometimes carried on the back of an insect even, an insect that is trying to get into the tree or around the tree, then any kind of open wound in the tree could be infected by that bacteria. And then it gets even, it gets more oozy, right? So it oozes out more. It, um, it's called, uh, a lot of times people will call this, oops, um, gummosis. So the word gum, they call it gummosis when they don't necessarily know what the problem is that they're dealing with. And this uh, this here drippy stuff um, is when it gets wet. One of the things that's different between sap and this disease is that when it gets wet again, sap stays hard, and the canker, the like bacteria ooze that is coming out of the tree gets wet again and it gets like gummy and weird looking and it keep because that's how it spreads it just keeps spreading when it gets wet basically um so that's one of the ways you can tell the difference is especially when it's raining yeah what's up baron oh i'm trying to unmute you hold on a second unmute yourself um there that's actually what happened to our cherry tree very, very common. Yeah, it's especially so common. We had, we had to cut it down. Yeah, that's that's what happens after after a few years of not seeing it and not knowing what to do with it. And where you live, you live in an area of the country where there are a lot of commercial large cherry orchards, um, in Washington especially. But um, that area of the country has tons and tons and tons of cherry trees. So the more of a particular kind of species that you have growing in a place, like the the more um, it's called like monoculture, so one species growing in a huge amount of space, um, the more you're gonna have pests and diseases that are like, wow, it's like a buffet, this is amazing, um, and the harder it is 
usually to control those things. Um, so this is a picture of a scar that is caused by that, um, by that bacteria. This is when it's dry uh, and before, maybe it has gone over a full winter uh, and it's scarred over, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's healed. This scar could actually be, uh, become like wet and oozy again uh, when the season, uh, when, it, when it gets rainy. Um, but this is the sort of thing you want to look for is like broken bark, peeled back bark, discolored bark, um, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, sometimes like this is swollen here. This is, just looks really weird. So swollen, swollen trunk, swollen limb um, also is something you want to look for. Then there's this other thing, which is honestly to me like impossible to really tell the difference uh, between is a different kind of canker, which is caused by a fungus um, called cytospora. So the cytospora, which has spore uh, in its, even in its genus name, uh, is another thing that basically does the same thing and is caused by the same, uh, this, for the same reasons. But as you can see in this picture, this is a cherry tree uh, that has, um, it looks like it's oozing in like all sorts of different places. Um, and that might be because it's a really, really sick tree uh, that's been sick for a long time, or it could be that this fungus was carried in on the backs of insects that made holes in this tree. Um, and then where those holes were, when the insects left, they left behind the spores of this particular fungus, and then it infected it from there and they came out of all those holes. Um, so that's something to look for, look for also in, in cherry trees, it's all over. Um, and this will get kind of like wet and sticky and weird um, in a rainstorm also and keep spreading. Um, so there are some interesting things that you can do to uh, try to get rid of this when you see it. If you don't, if it's not, uh, the easiest thing to do, if it's not in the main part of the trunk of the tree, if it's only on like a side branch, the easiest thing to do is just cut that branch off. Uh, if it's a small branch and it's not gonna like completely kill the tree, um, cutting off like this little branch right here or this weird branch that's over here would be, uh, would be a good idea in my opinion. Um, and you can actually make uh, herbal remedies to, cut, you know how we've talked about salves and um, you know, creating things with different types of herbs that help our wounds to heal? Well, you can do pretty much the same thing with trees. And a lot of people don't do it. It's not very common, but there are some organic, organic author, authors, people who have orchards that are like pretty famous, I guess, in, in this world of organic growing uh, that have written about how to, do, how to do this. So you would use the same, you remember, you remember comfrey and you remember stinging nettle and um, probably plantain. Um, these are things that are really good for us. They're also really good for trees. They're really good for soil and they're good for keeping them healthy. Um, the stronger that a tree's immune system is, just like the stronger a human immune system is, the more we will, the more that these trees will be able to fight off infection. Um, and something else that's really interesting is that if a tree is really strong, if a tree has a really strong immune system to begin with, um, and it has really healthy soil that is feeding it really well, and it's getting proper sunlight, and it has really good airflow, like when the breeze blows, um, a lot of times those trees, those healthy trees will stay healthy. They won't get infected at all. Um, so, you know, it's just like us. We're, we're dealing with organisms that have immune systems just like we do, even though they look super different. Um, and I think that's really cool to think about. Um, does anybody have questions? Before we get to that crazy bug that you guys just saw for a second. <laughs> so the next thing we're gonna learn about is, is one of the insects that causes this problem because they bring in these spores on their back. This is a really, really up close picture of the cherry shot hole borer. 
and the cherry shot hole borer is called that because it makes these holes in the these little shot holes in the bark uh, through the trunk of a tree of a cherry tree uh, to lay their eggs in. So this is the adult, uh, and this is the larva down here. Uh, and the larva is, you know, when the egg hatches, this is what it looks like. Uh, this particular stage of of this insect, when it's a in, when it's a larva, uh, it it will eat it eats part of inside of the tree, um, and that's why the eggs are laid there for protection and for food. Um, they're pretty small, actually, in reality, and a lot of times you don't even see the adults. Um, you usually, if you see these insects at all, you usually see them at the point when they're in this larva stage. Um, but I thought that this was a really great up-close image of, of what they look like. This is their front half, obviously, and this is their back half. Um, yeah, you have a question, Liv? Can't hear you, keep trying. <laughs> there you go, gotcha. Okay. Um, how does the fungus get to the bug? Does it like attach onto it? Is it like a part of it? How does the fungus interact with the bug that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, spores you know how tiny spores are um do you does that like do you know that like the average some mushrooms uh have literally millions of spores that are released by them by the bot when they when they release spores from the bottom of them literally millions and they're they're microscopic we usually can't even see an individual spore um those are literally there are spores from different species of fungus literally covering everything all the time everywhere um many 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 different species of fungus and you know dust particles all of these things that we can't see the microbes that are our, on our skin and in our bodies all sorts of like we are we are constantly kind of surrounded in this like soup of of particles that we can't see and almost every single one of them is totally fine, right? Most of them will not affect us. Most of them will not make us sick. They won't be a problem for us. Um, and the same thing goes with, uh, ha you know, goes with trees. Trees are probably all day, every day being covered in spores of different species of fungus and different types of you know, bacteria or, you know, things like that that are just floating around. Um, but every once in a while, if a fungus spore lands in exactly the right place um, and the conditions are just right, then it becomes a problem. So there's this, you could, you could say it's kind of like an accidental partnership between this borer and the fungus that they just because they both love cherries, because they both love cherry trees, they and they need cherry trees to survive, they are more often kind of found together. Um, but this, the back, the body of this shot hole borer is probably covered in a whole bunch of things that we can't even see, most of which aren't going to bother the, the cherry tree. Does that make sense? Um, and it's really... You know, I think it's fascinating that that we are constantly surrounded by this stuff. And when we're when we're healthy, and you know, like I just said about about trees and about humans, when trees and humans are healthy, being surrounded by all of that all of that stuff in the air all the time isn't necessarily a problem. Um, it's only when we're sick, or when the trees are already sick, or when they have an open wound, that it becomes a problem. Um, so that's something to just keep in mind, you know, throughout learning about all of this stuff at any point. Um, but that's a great question. Uh, this is a photo, <laughs> Elijah says, ew, in the chat. I, <laughs> I agree, ew. But insects are still amazing. They're, they're fascinating. And I think that it's important that we 
know that they, you know, they do deserve to live here too. Um, but sometimes they just, they're just too many of them, you know, like we've talked about in the, in the last couple of lessons. Um, so this is a picture of what shot hole borer holes look like. Um, and these words, fr this word frass, frass is a word that is basically kind of like bug, it's like bug poop. Um, it's like what comes out of the bug. If a bug is chewing a hole or boring a hole into a tree or into a plant, um, you know, maybe like a squash vine or something also is, is an example. They, that stuff that they're chewing out has to come out their back end basically in order to make the hole. So frass is a is a a kind is a nice word that people use to essentially just mean bug poop um, or like stuff that bugs spit out, <laughs> and that is what comes out of these holes. And this is also sap that's that's coming out. So it's a it's a mixture. Uh, so the sap these trees are trying to protect themselves, um, and they also have that frass that's coming out of the holes. So that's something. If you ever see anything like this that looks pretty weird, that means that you have uh, an insect problem. You have a, a borer problem in a cherry tree. Um, this is another disease. Uh, this is a fungal disease known as brown rot that is really, really common in prunus trees, in cherries and plums and peaches and apricots and, um, and nectarines and things like that. Um, it's a fungus. It's a, especially a problem when it's really wet um, in the in the springtime, especially. Um, and I've actually never seen it this bad before. This is a photo that came from Washington State, where I, I said there are a lot of cherries that are grown um, in lar like large scale. Um, I've never seen it this bad. What I usually see when I see brown rot fungus is in the fruit. Um, so have any of you, uh, any of you who have fruit trees or have maybe been peach picking or something, have any of you ever seen anything that looks like this? Or maybe you, you've even gotten grocery store uh, fruit that ends up looking like this? No? Well, that's good. I remember seeing brown rot uh, on my cherries. Oops. I'm trying to get to the chat. I see that it was, that somebody was saying something. Um, so I remember when I was a kid and I was telling you about that cherry tree that I loved more than anything in my yard, um, that the cherries at the end of the, like at, when they were super ripe and I hadn't gotten to all of them and they were still hanging on the tree and it was late in the season and they were like about, they were, they were just so overripe um, that they were like juicy and whatever. Um, and I couldn't get to them, especially at the top of the tree and things that like birds hadn't gotten. The cherries on my tree would get brown rot on them. And I just always assumed that that was what happens naturally, you know, like they, they get super overripe and they rot and that's just a thing. And to a certain extent, it is just what happens. Like fruit, everything rots when it, when it is old and, and, you know, overripe. Um, but it can be when it's a, when the fruit is still green like this and it's underripe and it still gets this brown rot, that's a really big problem. Um, so it's, uh, important to know, I think that brown rot fungus is very, very common and it happens a lot, um, like later in the growing season in the ripening because, fruits are just, um, you know, they just have to decompose at some point. Um, but very important to know. Um, <laughs> Liv and, and Elijah think that this, that these things are interesting and also ew. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's a little bit ew, especially if you're trying to get ripe fruit, right? You're like, come on. Um, this is the next one that we talked about that's, uh, this is not necessarily only on fruit trees um, and not only on cherry trees. Gypsy moths um, like a bunch of different species, but they especially affect cherries. And I wanted to show you what a gypsy moth looks like 
because most of the time we don't see them or maybe if we do see them we don't know that they are the essentially the parent of the um the parent of the caterpillars that we that we see so commonly and um yeah baron you have a question well, actually, no, it's just my grandma is allergic to them. Whoa, what does that mean? What happens? She gets a really bad rash all over her body. The cat up to the caterpillars? Yeah. Whoa, that's interesting. I have heard of a different type of caterpillar that does that. Um, my sister lives in Maine, and there are these caterpillars all of a sudden that appeared in Maine last year that have been causing really serious skin rashes in people. What are they called? The ones in Maine? I totally, I forget, but I'll, I can look it up. Cause um, my, yeah, everybody was like really freaked out <laughs> in Maine last summer when they appeared. Um, well, that's actually where my grandma lives. Oh, I wonder if the thing that's bothered, that bothered your grandmother is actually something other than a gypsy moth. Um, but maybe they are, they have kind of like similar habits. Um, they, maybe there's just like tons of them, right? Um, there are, there are things that, you know, tent caterpillars and gypsy moths, I think are often kind of confused as being the same thing, but I think there's a few different species that people call those, those things. Um, so the gypsy moth in particular, uh, I also wanted to show you an up close of what they look like because I think moths are like totally beautiful and adorable um, and that they kind of a lot of times get a really bad rap um, in in our world like a lot of people don't like moths and a lot of people love butterflies and they don't like moths and I think that's weird because um, they're so similar and many many moths are so beautiful like this is awesome this like this thing they got going on and these giant eyes and they're like beautiful colors and patterns. I mean, I think they're super cool. And I think that just like I've said a few other times in the past couple of days, like in moderation, in balance, if there, if there are some gypsy moths uh, that are affecting some trees, it's really fine and, and good. And that's, they are part of our ecosystem that we have to deal with. Um, but it's when they get out of control, when they're out of balance in our world, because, you know, maybe we have way too many cherry trees go growing way too close together. And maybe these, um, you know, particular species of pest bugs don't have anything. They don't have, uh, predators. So do you guys want to, does anybody want to tell me about like, what what I mean when I talk when I'm talking about like predator and prey and pests and any of that sort of thing anybody want to talk to me about that like that balance sure Liv like the food chain and um that's kind of like why most people don't like invasive species because they don't like fit very well in the ecosystem because they don't have any predators and so yeah like you said everything needs to have like a balance and there can't be too many of one thing because then that could totally collapse the ecosystem it's very fragile like if sharks disappeared then the sea otters and the fish would go like their population would explode and then they would die off because they would eat off all the yeah. All the different, like, tinier fish and stuff like that. And then. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's all great, great in, information, great explanations. I, I think that when we're, when we're talking about this balance and, and things that are pests, 
um, and things that are invasive species. These are all things that are, you know, implying that they're, that things are out of balance, that the ecosystem isn't able to deal with, uh, to naturally, organically deal with the number of species or the, like, quantity of one particular species that is coming into a place, into an ecosystem. Um, a lot of times, probably almost all the time at this point in our human history, these imbalances are accidentally caused by humans. Um, so, you know, humans are trying to grow a ton of one a ton of cherries all in one place and that's really unnatural for an ecosystem and somehow accidentally the gypsy moth or the shot hole borer the the shot hole borer is uh native to europe and it's now in uh the pacific northwest and i believe the gypsy moth i think is native to asia um so they don't have things most of the time that can uh, kill them. Um, so uh, I wanted to show you what the gypsy moth caterpillars look like. Some of them look like this and then there's others that have like red dots on them that are a little bit different looking. I think it's important to know that you know just like with this some of the gypsy moths are white are more white than others and some are more brown than others um, but these are both considered gypsy moths. Um, and I didn't find a good picture of the of the gypsy moth caterpillar with the red markings on them, but this is what they look like, and they're like in these crazy, crazy masses. Elijah, what's your question? Um, those they don't have the same ears. The two gypsy moths. They don't have the same ears. Is that what you said? They, they're yeah. they're crazy antennae. Yeah. Yeah, it's you're right. This these, but it's hard to say because this is a really close up. Uh, it's possible that the way that these are facing, you just can't see the the cute little like frondy hairy things on this one. But I'm not sure. You you might be right. Um, but they might you, we might just not be able to see them. Um, so gypsy moths. The the last thing about this these cherry pests uh, that I think is super cool to introduce you to, which is like a hopeful, really cool, also ew, thing is um, parasitic wasps. Have you guys ever heard about these? Anybody ever heard of a parasitic wasp before? <laughs> Elijah has. Um, Elijah, do you want to tell me about them at all? I don't really know about them that much. I'm but you just know, yeah. You know they exist. Yeah. Um, yeah, Liv said an example of a bug that's out of control is the spotted lanternfly. Yeah, that's one that maybe we could do a little bit of a lesson on uh, at some point soon because they're really important to know in, in our area. I don't know if they're where Berend is, but they are out here near us. They're in Philly and they're bad news. Um, so what the parasitic wasps are, a lot of them are referred to as braconid wasps, are these really 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 tiny usually very tiny little things that most of the time humans never see i've been lucky enough to see them a couple times and it's like incredible every time they're so small so this is a very small moth to begin with right it's a small it's not a big thing um this here is a wasp a full-grown adult wasp so tiny and these wasps are laying eggs they're laying their eggs in the uh, egg sacs of that are being laid by uh, these gypsy moths. So these here, this like I don't know. To me, this looks kind of like burlap or like like shredded up cardboard, right? That is actually an egg, a mass of eggs that has just been laid by these gypsy moths. Um, and these wasps are going in going right for it they are they are then um laying their eggs inside of these egg masks masses uh and what happens is this is a, this is another example of a parasitic wasp that is um essentially killing uh 
I don't actually know if they kill them right away. So this is where the ew, this is where the ew happens. So they lay their eggs in the back of these caterpillars, right? Or in, in these egg masses. And then the eggs hatch and they eat the caterpillars or they eat the eggs. So they're, they are considered, it, for, for us humans, would call these parasitic wasps beneficial insects. Um, they are beneficial because they are helping to control gypsy moths from getting out of, from them getting out of control. Um, but it's like super gross, right? It's like really intense kind of ecosystem, nature, predator, prey stuff. Um, and there are, yeah, live the, the eggs hatch inside the caterpillar and they come out alive and they eat the caterpillar. It's super intense. It's really gross and weird and also really awesome. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to find some other pictures for you. It's like totally gross and totally cool. And that's the way that nature is. It's totally gross and totally cool and totally wild. And humans, when we learn about this stuff, are just like, how is that even possible, right? I mean, you know, it's kind of like, uh, this is like a micro example, like a very tiny example of like a lion killing a zebra or something, right? It's like, it's exactly what happens in like the giant animal world. Um, that is also like gross and crazy and scary, but it's in this really, really tiny, tiny world that we almost never get to see because of how small it is. And yes, Liv, it is very epic. It is very cool, Elijah, and is very gross. And it's really important. It's, uh, it's part of the cycle of life that we, uh, that we need in order for our ecosystems to be healthy. Yeah, Liv, you have a question? We have like less than a minute left. Good day. Um, What'd you say? Uh, so is it the little black dot? Yeah, this that I'm circling with my cursor here, do do do. these things are these adult, fully adult wasps. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. So I think I'm going to have to say goodbye. Uh, Elijah, you can try, but you might get cut off. Um, no, 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 no. You're good? Okay. I'll say. All right. I'm going to um, think about what we're going to do tomorrow. I wanted to show you things in this book that are really cool. But maybe tomorrow. <laughs>